In a shocking 1700s historical document to black Americans, a German professor used the term Negro as a reference to black Jews both in Africa and in Portugal. The author also makes a clear distinction between the black Jews and black Moors. The Moors were largely a distinctly different mixture of black people, most of whom had converted to the Muslim faith. The author candidly points out that the black Jews were specifically targeted for the slave trade, and that the black Moors were intentionally avoided, and that the Negroes, also known as black Jews, were then sent to the Americas during the slave trade. Get your ebook and audiobook bundle today. Choose from the following three options. Option one. Get free copies of the original 1700s documents only. Option two, get an easy to read edited ebook plus free copies of the original 1700s document for a low price of ten dollars. Option three, get an audiobook for easy listening plus the easy to read edited ebook and also free copies of the original 1700s document for a low bundle price of fifteen dollars. Learn the real history they don't want you to know. All right, so today we're going to talk about the a little bit more about the Day of Atonement. As you know, Day of Atonement was uh, started uh, on Friday night, and so we're headed toward the Feast of Tabernacles, which will start Wednesday night, I believe. And so we're just going to talk about a little bit about the Day of Atonement. Uh, you know what what uh, we should be celebrating, but we're going to pull out a specific aspect of it, and we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the linen garments. All right, before we get going on, our he we're going to talk about a Hebrew nugget. It comes from Travels in North Africa again, uh, same uh, re source, uh, resource I used uh, last week. And it says, but Quran is not merely a Muslim city, a Muslim city. Uh, there was a time when it was a Jewish city. Uh, the Caliphate Empire, which made uh, Quran its capital, attracted a strong Jewish population. And then, if you don't know where, Quran is it's in uh, Tunisia. It said from the very day of its foundation, Quran became the capital of African Judaism. Uh, the Jewish leaders and rabbis of this city are known everywhere. In the eighth century, uh, the exilarch Rosh Hagala, Rabbi uh, Natrani, visited the, the city. In the ninth century, Eldad the Danite passed through the city, leaving their records of his marvelous adventures in search of the lost ten tribes. And then it said in the year 913, Akba, the Babylonian exilarch, was received in the city with royal honors. From that time onwards, Quran became a center of Jewish science. In the 10th century, Rabbi Hushel, Rabbi uh, Hananel, Rabbi Jacob uh, ben Shaheen, and Rabbi uh, Nassim founded the celebrated rabbinic school. So it was it was a bustling atmosphere here. Uh, you know, in Tunisia, uh, with 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 Hebrew culture, and then it said I, Isaac Israeli, Israeli, the famous physician and philosopher, revived the science of medicine among the Arabs, and so they gave this knowledge to the Arabs, and hardly less distinguished than he was his pupil, the Nash bin Taman, the physician and grammarian. The light of the school of Quran gleams through Jewish traditions. Uh, to our own day, but all the glory was destined to pass away. Quran was devastated again uh, and again. The horror suffering more than any other part of the city. So in 1056, the city was razed to the ground, and it was then that Abram uh, ben uh, Dawid wrote, and from that day the Talmud ceased in Africa. All right, rebuilt later. Quran became the holy city of the Muslims, close to Christians, closed to Christians and Jews alike. As late as the 18th century, four Jews who had dared to penetrate into this city were burned alive. So we see this transition, and that's why I was saying last week that when we study this history, we had to study it, uh, you know, in in respect to uh, when the Arab uh, invasion came, uh, because there was a there was a bustling. Uh, you know, the Jewish Hebrew atmosphere before then, and when they came through, uh, you know, between them and the uh, and and the Catholics, it kind of just wiped everything out. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Day of Atonement. Now, on the Day of Atonement, we talked about it before. The focus on that day is the High Priest himself. Everything that was happening in the in the Tabernacle or the Temple. 
this one man was carrying out all these things. So he had been prepping for this uh, day for a while because it was a big day. Uh, the sins of the entire nation was dependent upon whether or not he performed his duties correctly. This this is huge. It means that for the next year, if this man messed up, or if he was found unclean, or something was wrong, then the sins of the nation, people of the nation, couldn't be forgiven for at least another year until the high priest was able to go back in on this particular day again and try again. So it's huge. So, um, you know, their forgiveness was dependent upon how he performed. All right, so we need to keep that concept in mind. That hasn't, that hasn't, in, in the, you know, the overall concept hasn't changed. So when he, when he wore the garments here uh, with the different colors and the breastplates, the onyx stones, and all those things, he was representing the people to Yah. But when he wore these linen garments here on the right, he was representing himself to Yah. What are, we, what are we looking at? He he had to strip himself of all these other things because he couldn't represent the people unless he himself was found to be clean. That would that's part of it. He himself had to be okay. If he wasn't okay, he couldn't represent the people. And so that's why he had to go through these rituals and go through these things, make sure he was fine, so then he could represent the people and the atonement of their sins. So in this particular day, the high priest he would take off the glorious robes and he would put on his linen clothes. Uh, what we talk about on the right, just the linen. He would kill a bull as a sin offering for himself. He would take the uh, blood into the holies of holies and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. We talked about the mercy seat last week. He would exit back out. He would kill the goat as a sin offering for the people. So he had a, he had to kill a, a bullock for him himself and his sons, the priesthood, and then he had to kill a goat. Uh, for a sin offering for the people. All right. So he would take the blood of the goat back into the holy holy and sprinkle it on the mercy seat as well. So the high priest would then exit the holy holy, sprinkle the blood from both the bull and the goat on the altar to purify it. And when these steps were complete, the high priest returned to the people waiting outside. The high priest would now lay the sins of the people on the second goat, and that goat was led out of the city by a fit man into the wilderness. After that goat was released, the high priest would enter the tabernacle one more time. He would take off his linen clothes because he was ceremonially clean and would put back on his glorious clothes to represent the people to Yah because he himself was approved. And it said the remains of the bull and goat that were sacrificed were now carried outside the camp and they were completely burned up. All of these things pointing to the greater work that Christ was going to do. And so we talk about these linen clothes and, and, and the righteousness and all these things. We know that Yeshua, uh, you know, was being foretold through the bull because he was our sin offering. We know he was foretold through the goat because he was our, scrape, uh, our, our scapegoat. We know he was foretold through the mercy seat. We talked about that last week where we talked about you know, when Paul was saying that, uh, you know, he is our propitiation. So we know all these things. We know that he said that, you know, instead of going into the tabernacle made with hands, he went into the tabernacle in the heavens and offered up his blood there. So he only had to go in one time and, and offer his blood once. He didn't have to keep going back and forth in there, you know, like this high priest did one time because all of the animals were representing the blood that he was shed on our behalf. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, we could get it detail by detail by detail and just so much for everything pointing to him. He fulfilled it perfectly. But I wanted to concentrate on the linen garments because the linen garments, according, uh, you know, even, even if you should see the picture all the way through scripture, but it's well defined in Revelations 19 and 8. And so when he's talking about the linen garments, he's pointing to righteousness, right? So you see this in Revelation 19 and 8 where it says, And to her granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So the fine linen is righteousness. So when we see, and we go back in the Old Testament, we see 
this linen garment that the Most High is pointing to, he's pointing to righteousness. Okay, so in Leviticus 6 and 10, it said, And the priest shall put on his linen garment, his linen breeches, shall he put up on his flesh, and take up on the ashes which the fire consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. So this linen garment shows up early in uh, in the Old Testament. And it's talking about him covering his flesh. The purpose of the linen garments was to cover the flesh. Yah did not want to see the flesh of the priest. He wanted them completely covered. And he wanted it covered with something that represented righteousness. The linen itself was not righteousness. It represented righteousness. So we need, we need to understand that. And he wanted it to cover the flesh because he didn't want any other task that they were performing to be done in the flesh. He didn't even want to see the flesh while they were doing these tasks. Leviticus 16, he said, he shall put on the holy linen coat. He shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girl and with the linen meter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore, shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. So he, he, once again, he was wanting the, the, the priest, the high priest, to cover him, cover his flesh with the, uh, this linen because the linen represents righteousness. He didn't want him to operate at all with his flesh showing. Now, this is the spiritual principle. It's one we will get into later, but that's how he wants us to operate with our righteousness and not our flesh. All right. But the high priest. In order to complete his task, he had to make sure that all of the ceremony was done without his flesh uh, showing. So this proper representation that, that required that his flesh be covered, we can see this, uh, you know, uh, in Exodus 20 as well, when he told him how he should walk up to the altar. You know, you, you got you got your linen on, you, you got your covered. But he said, when you go up my steps unto the altar, he said, he said, don't make any step to go up to my altar. In other words, they had they would have some small ramps at times. But he said, don't make steps. I don't want you to lift your leg too high and then your skirt come up too high and I see your flesh. He said, neither shall thou go up by steps unto my altar that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. So he, he did not want to see the flesh. In Leviticus 10 and 6, and uh, Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and unto Ithamar, his sons, uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest you die. And lest wrath come upon all the people, but let your brother and the whole house of Israel be well the burning which the uh, Yahuwah hath kindled. So now he's dealing with the, with the clothing. And he's saying, don't rend your clothes because you're 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 ceremonially representing righteousness. You're ceremonially representing the fact that you have no sin. And if you rend your clothes as if you're repenting of something, then that means that you're ceremonially unclean. And if you are ceremonially unclean, then that would mean, you know, you can't stand on behalf of the people. And if you can't stand on behalf of the people because I'm looking at the people through you, then that means that the whole nation is cursed. Now, I'm, I'm saying it again. Here's the imagery. He told them, don't rend your clothes lest you die. And lest wrath come up on all the people, but let your brother in the whole house of Israel be well the burning, which Yahuwah has kindled. Leviticus 21 and 10, he that is the high priest among his brothers, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garment, shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes. Can't do it. The whole nation would be cursed. All right, so then we get to John 19, when Yeshua comes on the scene, and we see him showing us this linen over and over again. And so we get to John 19 and 40, and it said, they took the body of Yeshua and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the man of the Jews is to bury. And then John 20 and 5 and so he he's he's stooping down and looking in, talking about one disciple saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. 
Then come and Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulchre, and see if the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. So we see that he would bear it in the same type of clothes or the linen that the high priest would be wearing. He had something for his head. You know, he had he had the rest of the, of, of the linen lined there. But he had this napkin uh, about his head, but it was separate. He had separated it out for some reason and, and set, it, uh, set it to the side. All right, so we'll look at that and see what that means in just a second. In Luke 22, it points to uh, the work that Yeshua was doing. It points to the Day of Atonement. It points to the high priest having to be responsible for all of the work, right? And this is why Yeshua would say stuff like he came to fulfill the law. You know, it was, it was him and him only that came to fulfill the law. So we get to Luke 22 and 44, and we three, see something significant here, but you may or may get it. But it's saying, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When we see sweat, we see the anxiety, number one, that Yeshua was under in order to complete the work that he was assigned to do. Sweat in itself represents work. Right, it represents that he was the one that was working, and he was working so hard and with such anxiety that his capillaries burst in his skin. And not only was he sweating blood, but he was also sweating water two elements blood and water. So, what, was, what are we pointing to here? We're pointing to him, Yeshua, doing the work, his sweat equity if you want to put it like that, that he was the one that was doing it all. You know, he, he was the one that was doing it and he had to do it uh, having representing himself that he was the righteous one, that he was the one without sin. All right. So we get to Ezekiel. I threw this in here because, you know, uh, in Ezekiel, it's, it's a prophecy of, of the, of the reinstitution of the temple and, uh, and the reinstitution of of Levitical priesthood work, but there's a, there's a catch to it. He's explaining through them who he is. This is what Yeshua is going to do when he comes back uh, during this thousand year reign. So he's going to allow all of these things to start happening again, but not without teaching them what you know Israel and us what every aspect of of the Levitical law meant and how it's pointing to him. And so in Ezekiel 44, this prophecy it tells us something that's quite interesting. And he's talking about uh, the priesthood. And he said, they shall enter into my sanctuary and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me and they shall keep my charge. And it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner, inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments and no wool shall come upon them while they, while they minister in the gates of the inner court and within so he said, while y'all minister, you're representing me. He said, when you minister, only thing you can wear are the linen garments. You can't wear anything that, like wool because it's going to cause you to sweat. And watch this. They shall have linen bunnets upon their heads and shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. Now, why would he say it? Because he doesn't want us to get confused about whose work it is that allows us to wear the garments. He said he is the one that sweated. He is the one that worked. He doesn't want us to get it twisted just because we're involved in this thing. And he, he allows us to be a part of this thing. That the instruction that he gives for us to do that that work is what gives us our righteousness. He said, I don't want to see you sweat. I don't want people to even look at you and think that because you're sweating so hard in your flesh that somehow you need to get credit for what I did. So I'm going to command you not to even wear clothes that's going to cause you to sweat because I don't even want people to get the idea that it's you that's doing this thing. He doesn't want to see our sweat. 
And so we go back to Luke 22 and we see him in anger. We see him sweating. We see him working. We see him fulfilling all things. He said, I don't want you to get it twisted that the work that you do, the work that I'm commanding you to do, you know, is going to give you righteousness because it's not. All right. So he's telling us this. So let's go back then to what we were talking about with the napkin. Uh, that was separated out, that was lying about his head. And it said, the napkin that was about his head, talking about in the tomb when, when Christ was resurrected, it said, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. So when you look up that word uh, for, for napkin, uh, it was a cloth for wiping perspiration from the face and for cleaning the nose and also using and swathing the head of a corpse. So I believe that, that he said this to the side because he was saying it was my sweat. The work has been done. And he laid that to the side and separated out to let us know that he was the one that performed the work. That it was his sweat equity that did uh, the work. All right. So I, I, th I thought that was uh, pretty interesting. All right. So the feeling of our infirmity. One of the purposes of the high, high priesthood was to have a man there that could relate to the people. And he said that seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Yeshua the Son of Elohim, let us hold fast our profession. So he's saying you have someone who came like you, but he's in a different place now. He can, he can, he can relate to you. He said, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time. And then he said, he already knows, you know, every point that you bring to him, every weakness that you bring to him, everything that you bring to him, he experienced it here. So you can go boldly to his throne of grace and you can obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need all right as long as we understand there's his mercy and his grace he said you can come boldly he said but if you think it's you it's gonna it be kind of hard to approach all right so our righteousness is not obtained by works all right so we have plenty you know uh you know his his whole the whole picture of what he was trying to show is on the Day of Atonement, point to the fact that if the high priest hadn't performed all of the work and wasn't approved, nobody else was going to be approved. All right. So Titus, uh, it says, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So he's telling us that we were all messed up. We, you know, we all had issues. But after that, the kindness and love of Elohim, my Savior, to a man appeared. Then he puts this caveat in there. He says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Yeshua HaMashiach, our Savior. 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9, be not... Therefore, be, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of Yahuwah, nor of me his prison, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of Elohim, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. So we, were, we weren't called according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which has given us in Hamashiach, uh, Yeshua before the world began. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. What is he saying? The faith that you have. He said he gave every man a measure of faith. So even the faith that we have to believe in him was not ours. He gave it to us. He said it's the gift of Elohim. Not our works, lest any man should boast. Romans 12, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is coming among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as Elohim has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Galatians 2 and 16, knowing that a man is not justified by 
the works of the law. In other words, you can't perform the works of the law and receive righteousness from it. But by the faith of Yeshua HaMashiach, even we have believed in Yeshua HaMashiach that we might be justified by the faith of, uh, of HaMashiach and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In other words, you're not going to be able to work well enough in your flesh for y'all to look at you and say, you're good. Come on, Nico. Galatians 3, 8 through 11. And the scripture foreseeing the Elohim would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faith for Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law under the curse, for it is written, Curses every man that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of Elohim is evident for the just shall live by faith. So he's saying that if you want to be approved, your righteousness approved by Yah, you got to do everything in the law correctly. But sin, we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We, 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 our nature was messed up from the beginning. So we're kind of doomed there. All right, so this 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 idea of righteousness this linen garment that 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 we that we put on this high priest doing the work and 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 the father looking at us through the high priest because now he has he put on his royal garments and now he's he's able to look at us through him and because he was approved uh you know the the high priest uh in the in the levitical priesthood it was just for a year but he said this high priest our high priest, Yeshua, you know, it's a forever priest. So he doesn't have to go in anymore. He doesn't have to go in from year to year. So we have an opportunity now because our sins have been forgiven in the sense for our righteousness. Uh, you know, he doesn't have to do that, that work again. And there was one more thing, and I meant to put the scripture in there and I didn't. But it was talking about the high priest not tearing their garments. And uh, when Yeshua was in court and they were getting ready to, uh, you know, give him his sentence, uh, the scripture said that the high, when, when he admitted that he was who he was, the high priest tore his garments. And so it cursed that priesthood, you know, and because the priesthood was cursed and the people up under that priesthood at that time was also cursed because the scripture was saying that the high priest should not rend his garments it was going to curse it was going to curse the people because Yah was looking at the people through the high priest and so I was just I forgot to put that scripture in there but if we had to find it we'll find it so I'm going to stop uh, right there I hope that uh, makes sense so I didn't want to keep you long but that's what we should be celebrating we should be celebrating all of the work that Yeshua did and we it's so many aspects of the day of atonement that we could talk about I mean, we could talk about him being the, the scapegoat. I mean, there's the colors, all the different colors. I mean, just so much to talk about. And all of these things are pointing to uh, Yeshua himself. Um, so, you know, we have, you know, there's other videos out there that, that's been made that you can go check out where we go into some details of what each element of the tabernacle represent, the colors, the animal skins, everything that was built. But every element point to Yeshua. It's really powerful, powerful stuff. Points to his, his grace and his mercy. Points to his work. It points to what he's done. So we can trust in the work that's been performed. All right, Mr. Daniels. Yes, sir. So in regards to the tearing, not tearing of the garments, etc., um, the thing that came to mind was uh, when Christ was on the cross uh, in, in John, it says, when the soldiers crucified Yeshua, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them. With the undergarment remaining, this garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. And the soldiers said, let us not tear it. They said to one another, let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So 
it just kind of reminded me uh, of of that um, that account where none of his clothes were torn in Christ. Uh, you know, being the high priest, um, it just confirms you know what you said about you know the high priest not rending their clothes and so on and so forth. I just want to kind of bring that point out. Yeah, ex excellent point. Yeah, excellent. All right, anybody else? All right, so just remember, uh, when you celebrate, celebrate what, you know, he, he's already done. Uh, like I said, there's so much to get into with that. And then you can also celebrate what he's going to do uh, uh, in the future on those days. Now, when you're studying this, and, and I say this, and we don't have any more questions, we'll... Uh, We'll call it a day, but when you, when you're studying this and you're studying the feast days, understand that he fulfilled the the death of all those animals on Passover. So you see, but you see sacrifices being made on on the feast of tabernacle, and you might you know how did he did he die again? You know all these if these things represent him, but but the point of that is, you know when you read that he's he's saying. Uh, as these sacrifices are as or everything is like a memorial of what he done and it's, it's more pointing to when Israel will be accepted more so than uh, will accept his work more so than his you know that he did that work on that day if that makes sense so uh, when we study uh, revelations and stuff we'll see um, we'll see like the Day of Atonement imagery, imagery come up. Uh, I think it's Revelation it's the 11th chapter when the seventh trumpet is, is blown. And we see the uh, the holies of holies. We see the veil being taken off the holies of holies. And you see the Ark of the Covenant appearing in, in the heavens. You know, and there's thunders and lightnings and nobody can enter in, uh, you know, at that place for, for a while. That's that's day of atonement imagery day. So uh, you know, so when you read the book of Revelation, see if you can find uh, you know, what feast days that is pointing to. All right. Any uh any questions before we get out of here? Just want to make sure I ask one more time. All righty then. Quick, uh, quick, short lesson. Uh, I sent a link to any Enoch, the book of Enoch. So check that out. Um, just and just understand, we study Enoch. It's like studying Book of Revelation. <laughs> so we're gonna. It's gonna be some things that come out that's gonna be could, could be confusing. So, uh, how, how long? The when do we start that lesson? Kendall, when, when I hadn't I hadn't set the date yet. Uh, you know, maybe in two or three weeks, but I want I want to you guys get get a head start on reading it. And, in, and in the meantime, it. that's our homework. Yeah, in the meantime, that's your homework. <laughs> you know, I don't okay. want it to be in the you know because we're not going to do extensive uh, uh, Shabbat class and maybe hours. Uh, you know, each Shabbat, but I want to come in. I want us to come in with information and not reading it there. You know, because I you know, it's 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 a few people that are pretty serious about their studies, and they're already looking at this stuff, so they already have questions, and that's kind of what I'm trying to address. There's a hole here for those people who are really into uh, into their studies. All right, Novell. I just uh, Shalom. Um, I wanted to know when are you going to do the Shabbat and the uh, what was the holiday we, we getting ready to celebrate? The holy day, I mean. Well, the feast of tabernacles feast is coming tabernacle. up. Uh, I think it's Wednesday night, and then uh, as far as Shabbat goes, I was just telling uh, uh, John that it'll probably be two or three weeks before we get started on Shabbat. I'm trying to get everybody a head start on the on the reading. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, because we're gonna be I mean, in that's Enoch. a great love story. Yeah, we're gonna be in the book of Enoch, so um, all right. Um uh, let me see our emails. I saw a question about where we where we can get the uh, books. I sent an email out um 
with the link to the old book folder and also directly to the books themselves. So if you're on the email list, you should be able to access this. Check your email. All right. All right, no questions. We'll go ahead and pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this day's opportunity that you have given us to celebrate the awesome work that you uh, have done and continue to do on our behalf. We ask you, Father, to forgive us for our many sins and cleanse us from, from all unrighteousness. We also want to uh, celebrate you, Father, for getting uh, you know, everyone through the storms. And Father, we understand there's aftermath that a lot of people are dealing with. And Father, we just want to thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're going to do in that situation as well. We ask you for you to continue to be with us, to open up our eyes to what's going to happen. We know that, that, that stressful times are coming. And Father, we ask you to prepare us for the things that are going to come up on uh, the earth. We want to thank you for this, this opportunity once again. In your son, Yeshua's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Shalom, Amen. everybody. Shalom. 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 Shalom.